Welcome to First Federated Church's online video podcast of this week's sermon. First Federated Church is based out of Des Moines, Iowa. Please visit www.firstfederated.org for more information. As you know, during the month of August, we are focusing on the church. Specifically, we are focusing on what Jesus meant when he said that he would build his church. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. If you were here last week when we kicked the series off, you learned with with me that he was not there talking about a location or a building, uh, which is what the word church actually means. But the word in the Greek is the word ekklesia, and it means people. It always means people. People. And the word ecclesia carries a broader meaning. It, it means an assembly of people, a gathering of people, a, a congregation of people who are called out of their normality, and I'll tell you what our normality is in just a minute, to assume a shared identity and a common purpose. What is the normality for every person who is outside of the faith in Jesus Christ? The normality of everyone is that they are living in the realm of sin and spiritual death. And so Jesus calls out to those living in the realm of sin and spiritual death, and he calls them to come out of that and to take on his identity, to make him their common identity, and then to share in the common purpose of making him, Jesus, who is the gospel known to the nations of the earth. Now, as I said last week, uh, we've got 15, 16, 1700 years invested in using the word church. And so I'm not asking you to quit using the word, okay? It, but I am saying this if we're going to use the word church, as I will continue to do so, we must always, though, define church not as a building or a location, but we must always ascribe to it the meaning of ecclesia, a people, a congregation who are called out of their normality to share a common identity and a common purpose because at the end of the day, we are not a location as the church of Jesus Christ, but we are a movement, a people on the move with the gospel. Now today, I want to go a little bit deeper into this identity that we share together as as the ecclesia of Jesus Christ. Now my question is, the question I'm posing to begin with, is what is the primary identity that defines Jesus and us together? Okay, There are many identities that Jesus has and many uh, words that describe his identity in various contexts and so for us as well. But what describes or defines the identity of Jesus and his ecclesia, his church, Together. Well, that's what we're looking for today. To do so, let's return to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, and we'll begin reading again in verse 13. Ultimately, we are heading to verse 21, where we will find the answer. But let's get verse 21 in its context. Beginning with verse 13, this is what we find. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah or the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being." Now I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of Hades will not conquer it. Now here are two new verses that we didn't read last week. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Then he sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Now, I'm heading to verse 21, but before I get there, I just want to acknowledge that verses 19 and 20 are very curious, aren't they? I mean, all of a sudden, we're talking about Jesus giving the keys of the kingdom of heaven to us here on the earth. What we forbid and what we permit, he forbids and permits. What does all that mean? And why in the world would he tell his disciples sternly, do not tell anyone that I am the promised one. I'm the Messiah. Don't tell anybody. Not yet, anyway. Well, I'm not going to talk about that today. The assignment is for you to do some research on your own, 
to grab a commentary, go online, look it up, check it out. I will deal with that at some time in the future, but I read those verses because they're in the context, and I wanted to acknowledge the interestingness of them. And I want you to go and study them on your own. If you find something fascinating, send me an email, tell me what you found. But verse 21 is ultimately where we're headed. And here we find the answer to that question, what is the identity that defines both Jesus and his ecclesia together? And this is what we find. From then on, it says, from when on? From the time that his disciples discovered that he, in fact, was the Christ, the the Messiah, the Son of the living God. From that point on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem, that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. And he would be killed. He would die. But on the third day, He would rise from the dead. Father, I pray in these few moments that we have to look at this passage and other scriptures together. Holy Spirit, that you would open up our minds to the truth of who we are and what our shared identity is as the ecclesia of Jesus Christ. Father, for those who are part of the ecclesia, part of the church, may we find ourselves being encouraged and challenged by the things we uncover. And for those who have yet to believe, may you use these things to draw them today into your body, into a relationship with you, that they may become part of this assembly that you are building. May your purposes be accomplished in our lives and in our church, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I contend that if you take Christianity, and by Christianity I mean what it means to follow Jesus, and you boil it down to its irreducible minimum, you have these two things, death and new life. Death and new life. This morning I I tell you that Death and new life is what the Son of God becoming man was all about. I tell you that death and new life is what following Jesus is all about. Think of it from this perspective. We could go back to the Old Testament and I could make my case there, but I'll just start right here in the Gospel of Matthew. When the angel, I believe it was probably Gabriel, appeared unto Joseph, Mary's fiance, Mary the mother of God, Mother of Jesus, excuse me. Uh, when, 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 when he appeared to Joseph, what did he say would be the Christ child's purpose in living and in coming into this world? Does anybody remember? He said that he was coming to save his people from their, from their sins. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20. How would Jesus do that? How would he accomplish this purpose? He would do it through his death on the cross... And through his resurrection to new life. Friends, I'm telling you right there is the definition of why Jesus came. And is the definition of his core identity as the Messiah. Is it any wonder then that after his his disciples came to this revelation that he was the Messiah. That he would now turn his attention to explaining to them over and over again how that he must go to Jerusalem. How he must die and how he will rise again. This morning, I want you to to catch this, that the death and resurrection of Jesus are such an integral part of, 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 of who he is that one must say that they represent the core of his identity as the Messiah. Death and new life. There may be someone out there who is having thoughts to the contrary. No, I can't hardly believe that that would be true Death seems like such a negative thing. How could that be a part of the core of his identity? Well, think about this for a moment. The wonderful teachings that Jesus gave us that are recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the miracles, the absolute astounding miracles that he performed, the 
unbelievable example of love and grace that he lived out day by day. What meaning would any of those things have if he did not die for sin and rise to new life unto God? What meaning would they have? None. None. What good is a miracle if I'm still lost in my sin? What good is a miracle? What good is a teaching if I'm still dead in trespasses and sins? What good is an example of love if it's not being expressed in a way that changes and transforms my life? No, I tell you. I tell you that everything about Jesus as the Messiah in the flesh hinges upon his death for sin and his rising from the dead to new life. And so his death and new life are truly what give meaning to all that he said and did when he took on human flesh. He said it himself there in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. He said, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to do what, church? To do what? Tell me. To give his life. To give his life as a ransom for many. What is the primary point of today's message? Having laid this foundation of Jesus' identity as the Messiah, an identity of death and new life, here is the primary point. Don't let it pass you by. Since the word ecclesia means to share the identity of Jesus, it means that the, then that we who are the church are the people who, like Jesus, have died And received new life. The main point of today's message is that the the identity that we share with Jesus and that we share together is that we are the community, the congregation, the assembly of those who have died and taken on new life. That's who we are. And this truth is unescapable. Everywhere you look in the New Testament, you will find the image of death and new life being associated with the assembly of Jesus Christ, with the ecclesia, with the followers of Jesus. Take, for example, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. The Apostle Paul is writing here and he says this to believers, or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we were joined, we joined him in his death. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. You know, right there in in, in Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, you find God's plan of salvation from the, the outworking side of things. How it actually works. You see, the truth of of us who are the church of Jesus Christ is this, that we were originally born under the identity of Adam. Every one of us came into this world identified with that first man who was created, that first man who, because of his rebellion against God, cast the human race under the condemnation of God, and that condemnation is eternal death. Look with me at Romans chapter 5. And verse 12, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Uh, the, The only way to escape this condemnation of eternal death, friends, is that we die to our identity in Adam. And this is the death we're talking about that we share with Jesus. It is a a death to the identity that we had in Adam. The identity of being fallen creatures. Since it's impossible for us to do this on our own, Jesus came in human flesh to do it for us. That's what the Apostle Paul is talking about there in Romans chapter 5 verse 18 when he says, yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness, that act of righteousness was his death for sin and his resurrection to new life. This righteous act of Jesus brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone, and the context there is speaking about everyone who believes in him. 
Simply put, the way sinners are saved from the condemnation of God over sin is when they die to their identification with Adam and are born again unto new life, which identifies us then with Jesus. Death to sin and new life unto God becomes the unifying identifier that we share with Jesus and that we share with one another. We are the community of death and new life. Now someone may be sitting here this morning asking themselves privately in their heart, I wonder if it's really important for the individual Christian to understand those theological concepts. I mean, do I really need to know that and remember it and and live it out to be what Jesus wants me to be? The answer to the question is, yes, it's very important. Yes, you do need to know it. And let me tell you why I know you need to know it. Because the Lord Jesus gave two observances to his church. Two observances that continually teach us, preach to us, and serve as examples to us of this death and new life that identifies us with Jesus and identifies us to each other. What two observances are those? They are baptism and communion. Baptism and communion were not given to the church just to be nice little rituals that we do. Nice little rites that we uh, uh, go through every now and again. They were given to us to be pictures, to remind us and to teach us and to proclaim to us the gospel and to tell us over and over again that we are people who have died to an old life and have been risen to new life unto God. Let's talk about these this morning. Baptism. What is it? Well, baptism is a picture of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Tonight, we are going to be celebrating baptism as a church. We're going to be meeting out at Gray's Lake, and Pastor Danny will be here at the end of the service to give you more information about that. But I hope you'll come and be part of this. Come and witness this picture being played out ten times this evening as ten individuals who have come to faith in Jesus identify with him and identify with his his ecclesia, through this act of baptism. Why is baptism important? There are three things I want you to know about baptism that signify its utmost importance in our lives. Number one, baptism is important because it fulfills our obedience to Jesus' command that we be baptized. Remember in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus commanded his disciples to go and make other disciples. And in making those disciples, he commanded that they baptize those disciples in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Listen, the very first command that a a, a new believer is to follow is to identify with Jesus in his death, in his resurrection through baptism. Baptism is that public act of obedience to the command of the Lord. Is it necessary for me to go to heaven to be baptized? No, it isn't. But is it necessary? Yes, it is. How could you possibly say you are a Jesus follower when you fail to follow the very first command that he gives? It it, it doesn't go. And so it fulfills obedience. Secondly, it serves as the believer's public identification with Jesus' suffering on the cross, his death, his burial, and his resurrection to new life. I like to teach folks when I do a baptism class, or I'm preaching on baptism in particular, that the imagery that we are supposed to see and to be thinking about, not only if we're being baptized, but when we're observing it and watching it, when a person goes out into those waters of baptism, we are to picture Christ on the cross suffering for our sins, that he gave his life there. When the person is placed under the water, they're being buried in likeness of Jesus' death and his burial. And when they come out of the water, it is a picture of his resurrection to new life and our identification with that same new life. It is the primary means of identifying with Jesus. It's the primary means of identifying with the ecclesia that he is building. Paul said through baptism we join into his death and into his new life. His death becomes our death. His resurrection and new life become our resurrection and new life. Finally, baptism reminds everyone who's watching it of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? The good news of Jesus Christ. Well, the gospel is simply this. That through Jesus, we die to the condemnation of sin. We die to the power of sin. And through Jesus, we come to new life unto God. And we can live in that new life through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what baptism is all about. It is a reminder. It is a proclamation of the gospel. And this is one of the reasons why we don't do private baptisms. I've had people ask me, Pastor, I'm, 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 I'm kind of shy, you know. And I don't, I don't like public demonstrations and so I, I want to be baptized but could it just be me and you could we just go and do that and my answer is always no we can't because baptism was intended to be public it was intended to identify us it was intended to be a constant reminder to everyone who sees it and even to unbelievers of what it means to follow Jesus Christ and so it is a very public thing and if we are willing the Lord will give us victory over that shyness And enable us to represent him openly and publicly. Well, communion is also another observance that our Lord gave us to to represent this identity of death and new life. Communion is a picture of Jesus' broken body and his shed blood. The Bible tells us on the night that Jesus was betrayed, it was the night of Passover, that he took bread in the presence of his disciples. He broke it into pieces and he invited them each to eat of it. And as they did, he explained to them that this bread represented his body that would be broken for sin. And that's what sin does, friends. Sin breaks things. Sin destroys lives. And on the cross, Jesus gave his body to be broken, to take our brokenness, to take our devastation, to take our death upon himself and there to pay the price. The prophet Isaiah prophesied that this would be the case in Isaiah 53, 5. He says, but Jesus, that the Messiah, was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. Jesus then took a cup that was filled with red wine, and he passed it to each of his disciples, and he invited them to drink from it. And as they did, he spoke of that red wine representing his blood, blood that would be poured out as the payment for sin. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 tells us, for without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. This observance that we do on a regular basis taking the bread and the cup of communion. They remind us of Jesus' death for sin, which becomes our death to sin. Now, as I was studying this, I, um, I could clearly see the picture of death and new life in baptism, but I was having trouble seeing the new life part in communion because all that really is prominent in communion is at least the elements are concerned are a broken body and shed blood, which both speak of death. And as I was pondering on that, it was as though the Holy Spirit just opened my mind and reminded me of Paul's teaching to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul was, was in one hand, rebuking the church for its improper uh, participation in communion and teaching them the proper way to do it. And in verse 26, he linked the second coming of Christ with the observance of communion. Notice the scripture. He says, for every time you you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death till he comes again. And there's the link. You see, Jesus did not just die. He rose to new life. And he promised after receiving that new life that he would come and establish his kingdom of which all who are part of his church, his ecclesia, will be part of that kingdom. And it's in that kingdom that the fullness of our identity as Jesus' ecclesia, his assembly, those who share in his death and new life will be fully realized. Because at that time, death in all of its forms will be banned will be banished from our presence and the fullness of life in Christ will be ours forevermore. And so even communion celebrates not only the death but the fullness of new life in Christ.
As I said, this evening we're going to celebrate the baptism of ten individuals who have been called out of sin and darkness and who share this identity in the Lord Jesus Christ. But this morning we're going to observe communion together. And we're going to celebrate the broken body and the shed blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So I'm going to ask those who have volunteered to serve the elements to us to go ahead and get those elements now and come on and take your places and be prepared to serve here in just a moment. As those who are serving us prepare, let me just uh, share these thoughts with you. First of all, the elements of communion are for those who have come to faith in Christ. Only those who are part of the church, part of the ecclesia of Jesus Christ, are to take the bread and the cup because only those share in the identity of his death and new life. Today, though, we may have some here today whose faith, your faith is not in Jesus. You've not yet trusted in him. If that's the case, I would simply say, when those elements come out, just let them go by. And as I say that, let me say to you that there are some folks sitting here that cringe when I say that. Just let them go by because they're afraid you're going to be offended. They're afraid that you're going to be hurt. They're afraid that you're going to be embarrassed about that. Let me say this. There's no need to be embarrassed. There's no offense meant. There's no judgment. Every single one of this room at one time did not have faith in Christ. And only by the grace of God do any of us have that faith today. Today may be the day you come to faith in Christ. But as we, the church, observe this, this uh, important aspect of our faith, remembering the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, I just invite you to think about that. As we hold the bread, think about what that means. As we hold the cup, think about the claim that Jesus gave his body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins and allow faith to begin to be birthed in your heart. Servers, if you'd go ahead and come to place your place. This morning as we serve the elements, we're going to do so in silence. No music. I encourage you just to meditate on what the bread and the cup mean. Go ahead and receive the bread and the cup, and after everyone has been served, then we will receive them together as the church. So in these few moments of silence, reflect upon what this means. Take time to reflect upon your life with God. If there's any sin that is unconfessed, confess it now. And receive these elements with purity of heart in Jesus Christ. <laughs> 